Look for me there by Luke Russert. On June 13, 2008, Luke Russert received one of those unexpected phone calls that turn your world upside down. His father's assistant, she was the one on the phone, would only say his father had fainted and they were trying to contact Luke's mother. But Luke knew his father, Tim Russert, the NBC News stalwart. They'd all been in Rome together just two days before, and Tim had flown home to shoot an episode of his show. And he was not someone likely to faint. Luke suspected his dad was dead. He was right. Anyone who's lost a loved one can imagine what Luke and his mother went through. But their lost one was also famous, well-respected, and widely beloved. They couldn't grieve uninterrupted an outpouring of condolences, and grief washed over them from people around the nation, both comforting and exhausting. What followed for Luke was a decade of hard work, followed by years of travel and discovery. Along the way, he realized he'd been struggling to discover who he was and what a meaningful life looked like for him. In this audiobook, we'll trace Rushert's journey and see what lessons he learned along the way. The background. What's your family legacy? Luke Russert's is one of hard work and the American dream. Luke's grandpa worked tirelessly as a garbage man to provide his son, Tim, with better opportunities than he had. Then Tim worked tirelessly himself and became a legend in the journalism world. Luke felt the pressure of his father and grandfather's legacies and wanted to prove himself worthy of the privilege his dad worked hard to provide him with. Luke's mother was also a well-respected journalist and activist. More free-spirited than Luke's father, she was nonetheless harder on Luke. She wasn't impressed by good grades or accomplishments they were expected. Luke resented his mother because of it, even as he loved her. When Tim died of a heart attack, family, friends, and fans alike attended the wake. Luke delivered the eulogy to an audience that included John McCain, Barack Obama, and Ethel Kennedy. Toward the end of his speech, he heard his father's voice in his head, giving him encouragement and telling him to bring it home. But when the remembrances finally wrapped up, Luke wasn't sure where to turn next. The work? Have you ever been scared to face your feelings? Shoved them away? Sometimes we don't realize we've done so until later, when we build up the courage to face ourselves. That's what happened to Luke after his father's death. Luke threw himself into work less than three months after his father passed. He received offers from various networks. He worked hard, offering himself up at all hours for assignments. After 15 months, he became an on-air congressional correspondent stationed in Washington, D.C. Years passed as he grinded, staying up late, working weekends seeking, striving, and sprinting so as not to fail, not to miss a story, not to flub up on live television. Luke was conscious of the privilege afforded him both because of his name and his being a straight white man. The knowledge fueled his desire to prove himself, to make something of his life. What was he making of it? In the spring of 2015, John Bowener, then Speaker of the United States House of Representatives, forced Luke to face this question. He called Luke into his office and asked why Luke was in Capitol Hill, what his life goals were. Finally, after a decade of work, Luke sat back to consider whether he felt fulfilled in what he was pursuing. He admitted to himself that he'd enjoyed the fame the sense of importance he felt in being close to so many important names in the country. Fulfilled? Perhaps it will come as no surprise that he discovered he wasn't. Not even close. So, as many people privileged enough to have the option do, he decided to travel to find his purpose. The exploration. Some people jump in the deep end when doing something new, while others dip a toe in first. Luke was one to start modestly, with a solo road trip through Maine. It was his first foray into exploring the world on his own, and something he'd never done before, just drifting. No plans, no timeline, no company but himself and his pug, no purpose but exploring. After this first foray, he jumped in, visiting Patagonia, 
then Buenos Aires, where he met up with his mother. There they joined Thanksgiving at Luke's friend's house, where Luke's mom was the life of the party. The qualities that served her as a journalist empathy, interest in others, a calm confidence had others opening up, basking in her attention and inquiring about her life. You know the moment you first see your parents as people, not just your parents? This was one of those moments for Luke. He was in awe of her. They visited Uruguay and Paraguay together, too. Luke was nervous about the next stop on his trip, some extremely high-altitude spots in Bolivia. Before they parted, his mom encouraged him, telling him she believed in his abilities. Coming from his adventurous, hard-to-impress mom, it meant the world to him. Luke fought his altitude sickness in Bolivia. When he finally stood at 12,100 feet above sea level, atop a former volcano, looking over the Bolivian salt flats, the largest salt flats in the world, he was grateful for his mother's encouragement and his own perseverance. Luke continued his travels Easter Island, New Zealand, Cambodia. He cycled between wonder and uncertainty. Though he was meeting incredible people and expanding his mind, he questioned whether what he was doing wasn't, at the end of the day, simply indulgent. Did he deserve such wondrous freedom? Each time Luke faltered, he heard his father's voice, telling him he was exactly where he should be. By the time he was in Cambodia, Luke felt like a seasoned traveler. Rides that never showed up and plans that changed on the fly didn't faze him. He started seeking experiences away from tourist traps, trying to find the uniqueness of each country he passed through. He visited another six countries before flying home in February of 2018 to check on his mom and help ready her house for winter. He'd been traveling for almost 18 months. His mother asked him what his plans were. She thought it was time he started doing something. Perhaps unsurprisingly, he responded defensively. He left determined to prove he was doing something important. The reckoning. Have you ever experienced a moment where things start to sour? Where what once was fun and exciting suddenly becomes routine and purposeless? That's exactly how things went after Luke's conversation with his mother. During his travels, he'd grown a following on social media. Now, in Nepal and Sri Lanka, he grew irritable with aspects of travel he'd loved before. Any unpredictability or inconvenience annoyed him? He sought photo opportunities, posted for the likes. He returned home briefly to deal with boxes of his father's paraphernalia. As he sorted through awards and news articles, evidence of his father's hard work and legacy self-doubt overwhelmed him. He was nothing compared to his father. The 10-year anniversary of his father's death was near. He imagined all the people and news networks who would be talking about his dad, contacting Luke, comparing him to his father. So he scheduled a 16-hour hike in Iceland on the exact anniversary of his dad's death. Afterward, he attended the Soccer World Cup in Russia. Next, he traveled to L.A. to attend an awards ceremony with his mom, who was receiving an award. He was on the fringes of the events and felt even more directionless after talking with people who greatly admired both his mother for her accomplishments and his father for his legacy. If this is sounding like a downward spiral, it's because it was. But we're nearing the bottom, so hang in there. After the awards events, Luke drove from Tucson to Marfa, Texas. At the time, it was known as a bit of a hipster enclave, and Luke was seeking any experience that might lift his spirits. On the drive, loneliness hit him. An hour in, he saw an email from Mary, the woman he'd been seeing off and on again the past few years, telling him she was done waiting and they were finally over. Luke sped the rest of the way, driving recklessly, mindlessly. He sank lower. A few nights later, in Avilan, he drank copiously, binged greasy fast food, and crossed a dangerously busy highway on foot. Needless to say, he felt like utter crap in the morning. His racing pulse and anxiety told him he was about to die of a heart attack, like his father. He didn't, of course. 
but upon his return to D.C., he met with his doctor, the one he'd worked with ever since his dad died, to ensure the same thing wouldn't happen to him. His numbers weren't good. Finally, he acknowledged he'd been running from his problems for a long time. That very afternoon, he went on a literal run, his first in almost as long as he'd been avoiding his problems. He cut back on drinking, ran more, ate better. He found a therapist and started journaling. Things that can be so difficult, and yet that really help when we stick to them. At his grandmother's old apartment in San Francisco, which now belonged to his mother and her sister, he went over the many notes he'd taken on his travels. He pieced together a narrative of his last few years, writing what would ultimately become his book, Look For Me There. As he did so, he began to heal. He also realized he'd yet to take the final step in his journey, one he'd been avoiding since the start of his travels the Holy Land in the Middle East. He'd learned so much about the world while traveling, but when the time had come to turn his learning inward, he'd shied away. He'd tried to keep chasing travel for travel's sake, but that had soured. And just like he'd been avoiding looking into himself, he'd avoided the lands of his Catholic faith. He'd been scared of what he would find. But now a voice whispered to him, saying it was time to go. And so he did. The Revelation. Have you ever taken a risk, unafraid of the outcome, because you knew it was the right thing to do? That's just how Luke felt as he approached the border of Israel. He'd heard of troubles people sometimes had crossing the border. He saw many guards, some younger even than him carrying military rifles at the border. But he wasn't afraid because he knew he was meant to be there. He had no trouble while crossing, nor at any other point during his trip. As an American in Israel, he realized his own implicit bias caused by the media he'd consumed about Israel and Palestine. Though he was curious to explore and learn more truth about the lands and people there, the voice inside told him he should focus first on understanding himself. He visited several of the most holy places in his religion, Hebron, Jericho, the Mount of Temptation, the Church of Nativity. Everywhere, he felt a solemnity, a weight to his feelings of faith. Though he was scheduled to visit the Church of the Holy Sepulchre the following day, the voice inside told him to go that night, immediately after visiting Christ's birthplace. So he did. He arrived just before closing. Guided by the voice inside, he stood in line to enter what's believed to be Christ's tomb. He would have 30 seconds to pray inside it. He didn't know what to pray for. He felt a sense of heaviness. Then he was inside. He knelt leaned his forehead on the stone slab of the tomb, and prayed he'd felt lost ever since his dad died. He needed guidance. Finally, after what seemed like far longer than the 30 seconds he was supposed to be allowed, a voice answered, telling him he'd been heard and that he was to move forward and pray. Though he tried to ask more questions, his time finally ran out. He continued to pray for clarity as he left and found a white plastic chair to sit on outside. Suddenly, during his prayers, his journey flashed through his mind all the countries, all the miles, the last three years of his life. He realized he'd been searching for an answer to who he was. He'd been scared of his dad's legacy, scared of not living up to it, not being able to follow the same path. And suddenly he knew he wasn't supposed to follow the same path. He was allowed, was supposed to follow a new path, his own path. There. In the evening light of Jerusalem, Luke finally realized he needn't cling to the rock that was his father's legacy. He could be his own rock, could learn to be comfortable in uncertainty. This was something his father had never learned, and yet the voice within him as he traveled had been his father urging him on, urging him to this very discovery. The way Luke would lead a meaningful life would be different to the way his father led a meaningful life, and that was okay. He would accept uncertainty and share his story. That was, as one might say, exactly as it should be. Final summary. After the unexpected death of his father, 
The first thing Luke Russert sought to do was prove his worth through dedication to his work, similar to his father. When that didn't work, he looked for meaning while traveling the world. He knew he was on the right path as he learned and met countless people whose lives and worldviews differed from his own. When it came time to turn his gaze inward, Luke faltered, scared of what he would find. He lost his way, but ultimately returned to his path by seeking help and reflecting on his journeys. He found a revelation in the holy lands of his faith, realizing he could walk a path none of his family had and still lead a meaningful life. Wherever you're at in your own journey, stay open-hearted. Just as Luke did, if you keep searching with openness, you'll find your path. And remember, there's no one-size-fits-all when it comes to defining a meaningful life.